Jennifer Chase, associate professor at the Northwestern American University. And the work she's about to present is about the regulation of uterine glycogen metabolism, which is particularly relevant to understand the basis of some human infertility. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge my funding source from the U.S. government and um, Dr. Mendez. I um, got to learn about how to use um, copacity during the class last term. So I'm also a master's student um, at Manchester right now. So that gives me freedom to be a master's student, not a professor. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to thank, um, I need to thank the um, Dr. Rose's lab at the Idaho State University because they were the source of the, the data that served as the foundation for this study. Um, and particularly, Io, who is a new faculty member in our department coming in the fall. So I took his results that he presented during his research um, presentation and used them for mine. So that's where this comes from. They have a long-standing interest in glycogen metabolism in the uterus of the mink. Um, because there's a big mink farm nearby um, to where they work, and so they're studying um, there. Now, the mink is an interesting organism um, because it has this particularly long time between fertilization and implantation of the embryo. For humans, that's on the order of a week, but on the mink, they can mate, um, and then 60 days later, have the, um, have the embryo implant. So, during, so that makes it an important time to think about as a model organism because the sustaining energy for the for the embryo during that long period of time is comes from the uterus um, where there is a breakdown of glycogen among other compounds breakdown of glycogen to produce glucose for this um, embryo that's in stasis uh, this is you know, we, most of us are familiar with the idea of glu glycogen releasing glucose from the liver, and it's a similar kind of process, but over, but it's going to be hormonally regulated a little bit differently. And this has particular importance, I would think, for humans. Um, even just in the last couple of weeks at the University of Manchester, um, Dr. Alden's lab was recognizing that the placenta in humans is not actually, as it turns out, fully developed where you're receiving all of your energy from blood until the end of the first trimester. So that brings out this idea of extended role of the uterus to be very important. So what, um, and so how this process works for, um, is not surprising. Um, so glycogen is synthesized in, in the um, uterine epithelia under hormonal regulation influenced by insulin and estrogen, and then progesterone <coughs> contributes to breakdown so it can feed um, the organism or the developing embryo that's in the histotrope. So what, but however, the regulation of all this, so it has the growth structure in place, the regulation has not yet been quantified. So that means for this project, the um, goal was to determine the distribution of flux control for mink uterine <coughs> glycogen metabolism, but you can imagine that there's a broad goal of maybe using the same approach to identify risk factors and therapeutic targets for human, um, human development and issues that are in human infertility. Okay, so what I'll be doing in this talk then is to show you the in vitro data, then how I did the copacity model in it, and what the results and implications are of this study. So the data for me, um, they have shown in, this is, what, this is in cultured mink uterine cells, that insulin causes glycogen accumulation that can be halted by progesterone. So um, control conditions, very low glycogen synthesis at 24 hours. Um, and then again at 48 hours, this is sort of super linear. I don't really believe that glycogen continues on to infinity, um, as you'll see in the model part of this. And then that's going to be um, eliminated by when there's um, <coughs> when you have progesterone present. So that was the data that essentially I was working on modeling. So I wanted to create a copacity model to recapitulate this in vitro set of results. Um, I'll show you at the end the in vivo, and I made a pattern. Sorry, I made a poster for. Um, for that, that will be you can see during the next session. Um, so that I can make a model that would recapitulate this in vitro and in vivo patterns of hormone-dependent glycogen accumulation, and then use that to determine flux control. Okay, so the copacity model. Um, I went to the BioModels database to look for an insulin, since I learned this last semester, that's what I learned to do. Um, go to BioModels database to find a model that would be appropriate to use for this. There was one that was insulin, that had insulin-dependent glucose metabolism, but had a few problems um, 
I think, that the starting conditions for some of the compounds are in the order of 5,000 molar, and after 100 seconds, it accumulated 12,000 molar glycogen. So um, even though that could serve as a good structure, I needed different parameters, I think, for these things. Okay, so I adapted that to a similar, um, a similar model. This is going to be 24 reactions, 23 species. So we have hormones, um, insulin, estrogen, and progesterone that could influence um, uh, phosphorylation cascades in uh, 12, um, 12 proteins. And then the remainder, especially here, here in the center, is uh, the glycogen metabolic pathways. So I adapted those metabolites and the reaction equations from the one that was in Biomodels database, and to, to continue on having these phosphorylation cascades. Most of the rates then, it was very simple equations where the rates are proportional to velocity and substrate and inversely proportional to a constant. That had ended up with 10 um, elementary flux modes, six of which are related to the phosphorylation cascades and degradation of glycogen phosphorylase. So the enzymes that are responsible for making glycogen synthase, synthase and breaking down of glycogen um, here at glycogen phosphorylase. So those are regulated. Um, and then there were four elementary flux loads you can only see two um, that, are, um, that are for the carbohydrate metabolism. So um, the in vitro data here is shown with the dotted lines and the error bars. And I use both, first of all, manual manipulation so that the um, phos that binding of hormone would lead to changes in phosphorylation and then used COPAC-C to fit the, do parameter estimation for all of the terms to, to get this that would fit. Again, I didn't, I didn't worry about whether it fit that point and would go to infinity. So it would go, so glycogen metabolism was fit for both um, the high insulin conditions and then for progesterone and, progest and progesterone plus insulin. So no glycogen is made with progesterone and very little is made when you have progesterone and insulin, which is quite similar to what they saw in the cell culture model. So then now that I have a functional model that responds to hormones and produces a reasonable amount of glycogen, I use um, sensitivities and parameter scan to do a, the sensitivities, as you would know with that subtask, and then um, parameter scan using two different, two different ranges of insulin. I'll explain why I had to do that later on and did that to get this range of what the effect was. So um, first of all, we can see for these are sensitivities, so essentially control coefficients for, um, for all the velocities that are in the, in the pathway as a function of insulin. So you can see that influence, insulin does affect the distribution of control in these pathways. Um, and the, there's really a substantial amount, really substantial um, control coefficients on the order of 20 that are, um, that are present for the glucose import and down here the yellow line, which is glucose export to the embryo. So those are hugely important values. I don't know, obviously, at this point, whether that's a property of the model or of the system itself, because they haven't done anything like quantifying this, um, this kind of system. So, but it does really give us some immediate experiments that we can do with the cell culture model to adjust <coughs> blood glucose, blood, well, the equivalent of blood glucose. Um, I mentioned though that there was a, I had to do it in two ranges of low insulin and high insulin because there's really numerical instability in this range and I also have to sort out what that problem is and I'm open to suggestions of what I had done. I suspect that what I have is sort of an infinite peak in the middle of the um, I checked to see whether the parameters that I chose that were relative, that some of which were arbitrary was having an influence on the values by doing the sensitivity and what was not surprising and very helpful as it is proportional to that there's an effect of as a function of insulin. Glucose, the, how much glucose external has this large influence on it. And the insulin receptor and glycogen synthase are also um, really important. And those give some measurements that we can make next time um, we do the study to see what are, um, what are those actual levels of glycogen synthase that are produced. Okay, so the implications of this study, um, we really did make it was for to make a functioning quantitative model to look at the mink glycogen metabolism um, and the regulation of glucose import at the end of the export um, and that really hadn't been noticed at all before. and has not been noticed in the in, in vivo or in, the, in 
cell culture models, that that might be important. So those seem to be um, sort of focus maybe of what we should look at next in hormone studies. Um, and also that this external glucose and insulin uh, receptor are really important for glycogen synthesis, and those are obviously things that we should and could measure um, in upcoming studies. Um, like I said, I have a poster that I then did for another portion of this. They had um, data that was published fairly recently about what happens during the accumulation phase, then while the uh, embryo is in stasis, and then pregnancy to understand what is going on to regulate the glycogen metabolism in the live mink. Um, but of course, in that, in those circumstances, part. So yeah, there's hormone shifts that cause that as well. But in that, since this is in vivo models, they don't have data on what the hormones are during the whole course of the life, the, the uterine cycle of that. So that's in a poster. <coughs> So how did I use copacity, since that's what the point of the conference is? I used it both to create, so we created the model, um, like parameter fit to determine what would be reasonable values for glycogen synthase and phosphorylase to give a good balance of both synthesizing and then breaking down the glycogen as a course of time, and then um, used it for scaled sensitivities to understand what the control, control coefficient was, even in a model where the wonderful MCA function didn't work at all because it didn't really have a steady state for too many of the compounds. So I thank you um, for your attention. <coughs> Any questions? Which is the, the way in which, uh, is there a, a feedback a regulation of the glucose export and the glucose synthesis for black, from glycogen or the regulation? Yeah, How do you, you say the model that uh, the glucose has to be uh, decreased is the gradation or in synthesis? <coughs> okay, well, I, in, in this in the model, I made glucose transport across the membrane to the histotroph that it was actually a reversible reaction. So in that sense, there's some feedback um, that would be built into the model anyway, but it's not known as far as I know about whether there's other feedback from the histotroph. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, just ma'am. something could be also discussed in the break, but I mean, this uh, the is it that you get? Yes. I mean, uh, what kind of warning did you get for that? Just out of curiosity. Um, it had too many warnings. <laughs> okay. Well, the differential equations were having problems. I think is what I remember being present. Yeah, so I have it with me. I can I can recreate all kinds of problems. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'd be happy. Ha no, I, I, don't, I was assuming again. It looks doesn't. It looks to me like there's some sort of infinite peak that I've made. Um, in, in but there, but you is. haven't played around with the numerical parameters for the integrator. I don't even know how to do it. Okay. They're, they're mostly hidden now. <laughs> okay. Is there any other question or suggestion? <laughs>